Good morning, welcome to Portugal, welcome to Lisbon, everyone. So, we will talk about this green transformation and I have a luxury panel, as you can see. So, with no further delays, I would call Mr. Otavio Simões, President and CEO of Tellurian from United States of America, so you're very comfortable speaking in America. Uh, yeah, on the orange. Uh, you can pick a color, by the No. <laughs> you know, the orange economy. Also, Miguel Predemens, Business Developer Management from CGR Renewables Portugal. Miguel, are you here? Olá, Miguel. Bem-vindo. Manel Protasio. Sorry, Manel. Infrastructure, Energy, Natural Resources Group Executive Partner at VDA, Vieira de Almeida Law Firm. Ah, um grande beijinho. Nós somos mais de beijinhos. Sinto-me sozinha na minha condição de mulher. Vou chamar a Inês Rocha. Inês Rocha, Managing Director for Impact and Partnership, European Bank for Reconstruction and Development. Olá, Inês, muito bem-vinda. Online, I welcome Astin Chicoco. Good morning. He is a Managing Director of Regions and Mayoral Engagement Regional Director of Africa at C40, South Africa. Good morning. Good morning, Astin. Everything okay? Good morning. Good morning. So we hope to meet Agnes Kalibata, but for the moment we don't um, have the connection right away with the Rwanda. Uh, we'll try a little bit later. So first of all, I would start with, as usual, the state of the art. What are your main concerns when we talk about green transformation and I would say a green revolution, not only in Africa, but also in Europe? And I will start with Otavio because I know your point of views are quite challenging for our, for our panel. Tenho o seu microfone. Desculpe, Otavio. Não temos todos lapela. Cada um tem o seu microfone. Ok. Bom dia a todos. Obrigado pelo convite. Um, obviously, I'll switch to English so I don't say anything in Portuguese, and then my legal team will come after me. So, the opposite of uh, the Minister <laughs> of um, The state of the art is complicated. Um, let's start by saying that we're going in the wrong direction, not just a slight deviation, we're actually going backwards. Um, to achieve net zero by 2050, we need an 8% reduction per year of carbon emissions. The last five years, we've actually had an increase every year of 1%. So, clearly in the wrong direction. And there's a number of reasons why, which I'll try to frame so that our discussion goes forward from that. Um, we burned more coal in 2021 uh, than every year, any year before, and that was before the Russian invasion of Ukraine. We burned more coal in 22. We're on the path to burn more coal in 23. So that's a problem, and uh, let's see why that happens. I think one of the main reasons why that occurs is because we have this disconnect between ambition and reality. Uh, by 2050, we'll go from 8 billion people to 10 billion people, most of them in Asia, Africa, and Latin America. By 2050, the energy demand will double. Actually, the projections from the IEA in the 2021 outlook is a 47% increase in energy. And when I speak energy, I don't just speak electricity, because that's only 25 to 30% of the total. Energy for transportation, mobility, medical care, fertilizers, plastics, every industrial processes, the steel and cement uh, making that we need to do all of the wind and solar plants that we have, the mining, the processing plants that are not renewable, by the way. Mm -hmm. uh, they produce cobalt and titanium and polysilicon, all those things that occur. And so we have 140 million people entering the middle class every year. Uh, it is impossible for us to say to continents like Africa, stay where you are, continue to burn coal, wood, and animal waste for your indoor cooking with more than three million children under the age of three suffering from cataracts, yeah. or poor sectors of the population in Nepal, uh, children under the age of 10, 50% mortality rate. That's an outrage. I refuse to be part of that narrative. Mm -hmm. And so we, we have to stop telling Africa and Asia and Latin America what they should do based on our values and our economic of, uh, affordability. So with that, we go to what's really then the definition of sustainable energy. To me, it's got three elements. Environment, not just the carbon dioxide, not just greenhouse gases, not just ozone, but air, particulates, uh, nitrogen oxide, sulfur, all the things that really we cannot live with and need to clean up. Land from uh, when we do mining and processing, water. So that's the environment. The environmental performance is, we should word it, it's one component. The next one is economy. People need to be able to afford the energy, not be intermittent or be volatile so that businesses can't invest. 
And how do we do that when we have 4 billion people living on less than $7 a day? How do we live, do that when we have 3 billion people in energy poverty? As an example, my friends in Nigeria keep telling me they have 200 million people, which is correct, and the average consumption of electricity total for the country is 6,500 6, megawatts an hour. Portugal, with 10 million people, is a, the exact same number. How does that work? It's not sustainable. And by the way, Portugal doesn't fit in the top category of energy wealthy countries. It's doing very well, but it's still not at the top as heating and cooling issues come up. So we have economy, environment, and the third piece is energy. It's got to be affordable, it's got to be available, not intermittent. Otherwise, you cannot provide the type of living standards that people aspire to, whether it's in Africa or Asia. So what's the disconnect? It's very simple. We have an ambition that along with it became a narrative that we're not going to invest in hydrocarbons or fossil fuels. By the way, 19% of the CO2 emissions in the world come from deforestation, which has biodiversity issues. 12%, which is really hypocritical, come from the countries like the United States and Europe sending the production of goods to countries where they have higher emissions. BMW just moved their factory of Mini Cooper electric cars to China in order to take advantage of coal power to build the electric cars. Think of that one for a minute. Uh, it doesn't quite work. Um, and then we have Europe that, in the, as a result of the atrocious, invention, atrocious events of 2022 in February, decided that we're going to divert LNG to, to Europe. And what did that cause? Well, it caused Bangladesh to go dark. It caused Pakistan to abandon their policies on clean fuels and quadruple their amount of coal. It caused China to license the new 106,000 megawatts of new coal plant. It caused Indonesia, who signed the accord to actually shut down coal plants, to actually build more than they were shutting down. And it caused Vietnam, Philippines, Thailand to start questioning their policies. The one country, by the way, and somebody made a mention to that earlier today, the one country, and I had the pleasure of being with them in, in February, that has actually written their book, it's called the Green Book, appropriately, to actually to go from here to net zero in 2060 for them, it's India. But they've done it in a way that actually have written a chapter for every year, taking into account right. industrial evolution, living standards, population. Most governments have done the first three chapters and the last five. And all the chapters in the middle is a lot of hand-waving of how they're going to get there without specifics. And part of it is because the narrative is not acceptable. And they've done it. The conclusion is record investment in wind and solar in India. It's record investment in hydrocarbons. It's record investment on conservation. But they've done targets, so they'll be able to measure whether they're going to do it or not. That's how we're going to get there. And part of it in relation to this forum being about Africa is really a very simple one. We cannot continue to take the resources out of Africa to feed the economies of Europe and think that's okay. Um, my minister, my friends in Uganda keep telling me, you want me to transition from what? <laughs> you guys are worried about the end of the world, I'm worried about the end of the okay. week. Mm -hmm. and, and some people, the end of the day. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So that is, we need to help, if we talk about, uh, Tony, uh, there he goes, you ask me for something challenging, we need to start helping, not helping, working with the African uh, countries to really help them install processing plants for their natural resources so that those natural resources are not mined in Africa and go to China for processing, giving us 90% insecurity of our supply. So that's my challenge to all of you. That's the framework that I like to continue mm -hmm. our discussion and I look forward to it. Thank you. We only have one hour, <laughs> Inish. Can, I don't know if you share the same amount of concerns as uh, Otavio, or if you can bring us a little bit more positive uh, view. Thank you, and it's a real pleasure um, uh, being here. Um, I, I think you know we are really living on an unprecedented scale of human intervention. You know, quite catastrophic and, and growing. And actually, we are seeing this. You know, in the news today with the scorching temperatures in southern Europe um, that, that we're experiencing. And, um, you know, we've, we've given a few um, statistics around it, and, and Minister Cordero mentioned the one-point-point increase um, from the pre-industrial area and on the temperature. And that's an average, because if we look at what's happening in Europe, it's 2.2. In the Arctic, it's 3 degrees. 
So this gives us a sense you know, of, of the dramatic uh, changes. And one of the concerns uh, that we have is also reaching the tipping point. You know, uh, these points whereby you know, the, the changes then accelerate into devastating uh, effects. I mean, we have some, some very striking um, other statistics. You know, we have made more than 500 billion tons of concrete, 8 billion tons of plastic. This is double the mass of the entire animal kingdom altogether. We have consumed more energy in the last 120 years than ever before. So the, the, just the scale of an acceleration of, uh, you know, of, of the impact, of the human impact, is, is, is very um, disturbing. So the rate of change is unprecedented. I think this is, you know, what, what is the, uh, one of the biggest uh, challenges. Now, we, need to, we know we need to change uh, the way we generate energy and electricity and you know um, um, so the European Bank for Reconstruction Develop is a multilateral bank there has been some some references before on the role of multilateral institutions we have one of uh, our biggest partners is the EU we also operate with the global gateway the EFSD guarantees and and all the instruments and this is really necessary because climate change and I'm quoting here um, Nicholas Stern who is a um, former chief economist of the, of the EBRD said that uh, climate change is the greatest market failure you know we have this big uh, negative externality and and we haven't been able to to sort it out so we need to change the way the market operates and this is a role for us for governments for multilaterals uh for and in fact you know many of the participants here that have you know an opportunity to action and change some of the regulatory environment to allow for markets to change and I think to me, you know, the biggest challenge we need to do is that we need to change from the type of energy that we use at the moment, which is low upfront cost, but higher running costs, to a type of energy which is more zero carbon sources such as wind and sun, but that has a higher upfront cost and then a lower running cost. So to me, this is the, the biggest yeah. challenge. Mm -hmm. Manuel, good morning once again. And Starting with your uh, approach, your framework for this morning. <laughs> Bom dia, obrigado, obrigado pelo convite. Um, switching to English, um, I would pick up uh, on what Otavio said because my concerns, when I, when I looked at your question, were more or less around the around the same area. As a lawyer, I would like to start with a number. <laughs> are very good numbers, you know, <laughs> <laughs> which is 570. Yeah. 570 million people who have no access to energy, clean or otherwise, in Africa. And so it is only reasonable to say that they, they may have a different set of priorities. Mm -hmm. Again, picking up on Otavio, uh, um, that virtuous triangle of uh, green energy policies, sustainable, affordable, mm -hmm. secure, um, might be seen in a different way if you have no access to electricity whatsoever. And uh, that is something that may tell us that in spite of the European Union being reasonably and, uh, and very rightly, let's put it so, uh, at the forefront of climate diplomacy and green transition and all that, that we really may have a mismatch in terms of priorities with the people that we say we're going to help. And there's another structural issue, which is our green transition um, is also depending on continuing with the extractive model under which we have ripped out riches from the African continent. So mining, so oil and gas, so uh, transforming or not oil and gas into hydrogen, into uh, more, more convenient fuels, let's say. And uh, as we were discussing before the panel, we, cr we clearly need to um, listen to people, then listen to their priorities. Um, we do have a set of very reasonable, very good instruments and financial instruments in European Union and in the World Bank and in some of the, um, of the multilateral banks and the FIs. Um, which will help the green transition into a greener generation, a more, more renewable generation, into even um, uh, transport networks for electricity and all that. But um, 
we need to transform that into a business model which will actually um, permit, not help, but permit the uh, African countries or most African countries, Africa, we tend very condescendingly to treat it as a, as a country, but it is a continent, um, most African countries to also to move into a more industrialized and modern uh, um, and modern approach to economy. Um, one of the good things here is that we have seen, at least in the energy sector or in the generation sector, that um, what we uh, Europeans and American and North Americans have done over decades, um, some parts of Africa tend to do by leaping forward in terms of technology, in terms of payment systems in terms of uh, off-grid management, off-grid generation, off-grid distribution, and all those things that we lack because we never needed them, mm -hmm. we lack in Europe, but uh, let's hope that they can leap forward in this transition as well. Okay, thank you so much, obrigada. Miguel, if you please, <laughs> your state-of-the-art view. Thank you, thank you, and first of all, on behalf of the CGR group, Renewables, thank the Diaspora Council for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here among such distinct panel. And uh, before presenting a bit about the company as well, just to say that it's great to see the excitement and speech that Minister Abraham Vicent has done, rightly so addresses that, and Anita, I would say it's great to see the vibe and eye-opening remarks that, uh, that we had so far. Allow me first to tell you a bit about uh, CGR Renewables. We are a global service provider, providing full EPC engineering procurement construction in the renewables energy, working all phases of a project's implementation. We have a track record of 12 gigawatts built over 25 countries across Europe, uh, Asia, and Latin America. And you may be asking, where is Africa? Mm -hmm. Yes, Africa is our next strategic priority where we would like to replicate the success that we have had as a group in Africa, bring the know-how, share experience, and build a sustainable future over there. At CGR Renewables, we are also committed to the fight of climate change, what we're discussing today, and this brings us to the um, topic of discussion of this panel, Green Transition, bringing Europe closer to Africa. And uh, we know that climate change is, um, is a concern for, uh, for Africa, but also a great opportunity. Is a concern, as we have discussed today, because Af Africa suffers more than the rest of the world, but contributes the least. We've heard many statistics, and then I'll add two more to the equation to reflect this. If we take South Africa out of the indicators that normally are associated to, to global emissions, we see that the continent contributes to 1.5% of global emissions, which compared to the size of the continent, is very small. Additionally, according to research published recently by, by McKinsey, today around 36% of Africa's population is, at re is exposed to at least one uh, risk of climate hazard. It can be floods, droughts, um, and uh, by 2050, we know it's expected that this number will increase to 45%, meaning that around 900 million people in Africa will be exposed to climate change. And this is something we need to, to address in Europe, in Africa, and uh, around the world. And to say as well, the opportunities, because uh, mm -hmm. Africa has a immense, immense opportunities in terms of renewable energy, because why? Africa is the richest uh, region in the world in terms of solar radiation, though it doesn't take fully advantage of this source of electricity. And second, as well, Africa has today the opportunity to bypass the use of traditional fossil fuels and go directly into sustainable energy systems for its um, future. And just to finish that, to materialize this idea into action, we just need the financing which is a topic we'll maybe discuss later. Yes, Thank we you. will. Thank you. Hastings Shikoko, good morning once again. So now we hear your uh, concerns, main concerns regarding this green transformation. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. And uh, greetings 
from Tanzania, Dar es Salaam, where I am. I'm sorry I could not join you. Uh, I'm here also with uh, African cities discussing the same climate change challenge. But I'm glad that I can engage with you um, through technology if it cooperates. The main concerns, I represent an organization that is working with uh, mayors from mega cities of the world, C40 Cities Climate Leadership Group. So I'll bring in a city's perspective. Some of the concerns that have been raised by the previous speakers resonate with me as someone who is working at the, cities, at the city level. And I will, not go, uh, I will not dwell much on them. I think a point has been made that we are not doing enough to actually cut the dependence on fossil fuels by divesting into other sources of energy. We need to stop what the other speaker has said, hand-waving and really come up with concrete actions that can help, uh, can help solve the solution. The emissions are not peaking. Uh, so definitely we are either not doing enough or we are heading the wrong direction. We need to correct that. But I want to add a dimension to, to that and it's about climate justice or injustice that is, um, that is uh, brought about by climate change. The, the immediate uh, previous speaker talked about climate change being caused by uh, some geographies, some geographies, but impacting other geographies. But I would like to get, to get a bit deeper when you look at the, at the city, city space. We need to ensure that as we bring these solutions, we are as inclusive as possible in the, in the city and really reaching to uh, indigent communities or low-income neighborhoods in the, in, the, in the city so that we don't leave anyone behind. We need to democratize the energy space and ensure that everybody is included. COVID-19 taught us that we are not uh, moving together. There are some people that we are leaving behind. Can we learn from that? And as we address, address the climate crisis, we make sure that it's inclusive climate action that we, we, we pursue. It's inclusive energy action, actions that we pursue so that we move together. Sometimes uh, when we are working in African cities, we tend to shy away from informal settlements in those cities. And, but that's a characteristic of an, uh, most African cities. So we can't actually, uh, we can't choose. We need, if we are working in Africa, Let's, let's, let's work with everyone in these African cities. Of course, there are excuses that I don't buy, I don't subscribe to, where we say it's difficult to get data from informal settlements, difficult to really get the statistics that we need about slums in Africa. That excuse does not hold water to me because we are able to get data from the moon, from the other planets. Why can't we get data from just our cities, a pocket of our cities? So that's the main concern for one main concern for me. The last concern I would like to highlight is I know we'll talk about it. It's basically where is the money to actually do these actions? An estimated uh, $2.5 trillion US dollars of climate finance is needed annually to safeguard urban populations. I'm just talking about cities, to safeguard urban populations and empower cities to do their part to meet the international climate targets and avoid economic, environmental, and humanitarian catastrophe. $2.5 trillion for cities to be on the right pathway. There is an urgent need to close the urban climate finance gap. Mayors are implementing science-based climate action plans uh, but finance isn't keeping pace with the commitment that mayors from C40 cities are making. When you look at the fossil fuel industry, finance is flowing there. How do we reverse the flow to also come to the green sector? We need the $5.9 trillion per year of public subsidies for fossil fuels and the $1.1 trillion that was invested in developing new oil, gas, and coal fields in 2022 
to instead be invested to cut emissions and improve resilience. Otherwise, if we don't put money in the green sector, we are not going to actually achieve the transformation that we need in that sector. Uh, when, uh, when, if money continues to flow towards the fossil fuels, then that's the sector that will win. And we won't win this, uh, this battle against climate change. Let me stop there and I'll come again as the, as the conversation uh, evolves. Thank you so much. And as soon as you said, where is the money? I looked at Ines. Because, uh, well, she's the woman in, no, no. Because your bank, uh, when we look at green economy financing, last year reached 50% of total business volume at a record of more than six billion, am I right? So, uh, but you're expanding and now you're um, trying it. I think it was already approved, uh, the amendment to the bank's status that allow you expansion for sub-Saharan Africa, that's the name, right? So what does this mean? There will be money for everybody in Africa as, as Tiki is, is, is waiting and wishing for? <laughs> Thank you. The, the question of, of, of financing for, uh, for, for climate in these is a, is a critical one. And, you know, very quickly we went on to how do we finance this huge gap? And um, I think the multilateral institutions uh, such as the EBRD, but, um, you know, others. I, I noticed that Bank of Foment is also here. I was just uh, speaking earlier, but we, we have also representatives of the World Bank, IFC. So the, the multilateral institutions and development institutions has a huge role to play. Um, because in fact, you know, we have this this issue of the kick up kickstart of some of the investments and, and reducing some of the costs at the beginning. And we need to mobilize also private sector investment. And in order to do that, one useful tool is de-risking. So usage of guarantees, and we mentioned earlier before the, the global gateway programs, uh, again, from the, from the European Commission, which has a program attached to it of, of guarantees, such as the FSD. Th these will really allow mobilization of, of private sector investments. Uh, because without the private sector, we won't be able to uh, address you know, this huge gap uh, yeah. that is needed. Now, the bank... So um, EBRD indeed has um, had a record year in terms of uh, green investment, six billion last year. We're already at 60% this year in terms of percentage. Again, you know, a record year of, of, uh, of investments. And I just want to give you a couple of examples of some of the investments we've done in Africa. We're, um, in fact, our shareholders have now approved a gradual expansion to uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, but we are already operating in uh, in Northern Africa, uh, in fact, in Egypt, Tunisia, and and Morocco, and we we have done we've become actually uh, one of the key partners for Egypt on renewable energy. We've done a very large investment on the Benban solar um, park. So some of you may may know uh, this is a 1.1 billion investment on 16 uh, photovoltaic. Uh, uh, soil panels. You can actually see it from the moon, which is, is, is really uh, um, impressive. But also as part of Egypt's commitment and, you know, on the COP27, they made a, a very clear statement into that, they, that they wish to double their renewable energy sources by 2028. Uh, they have launched uh, something called NOAFI, which is the nexus for water, food and, and energy. And actually EBRD is, uh, is the partner for the energy uh, part. And, and this is decommissioning of, um, of, of five gigawatts of oil and gas fueled uh, energy and developing 10 uh, gigawatts of solar and wind by, uh, again, 2028, including green, uh, green hydrogen. And, and this is a massive undertaking that, um, you know, Egypt it is, is doing. And there are investments that we can do uh, associated with it and bringing in a uh, private private sector as well so these are very concrete examples of things that we can do and opportunities we are seeing already uh, in Africa but some of these things you know they they're, they're, the technology is still not there the but maybe we can talk about a little bit of the green hydrogen um, you know it's very promising but it's still very costly for private sector investments and this is where multilaterals and governments and institutions, uh, that also including, for example, the European Commission, who is giving you know, um, big support also for, for green hydrogen with a green hydrogen bank, uh, can, can really help. 
Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, the, the financing, at least in the, in the beginning, it needs to be a combination of multilateral government support, uh, some concessional finance, uh, for sure, um, until we reach the point where, you know, then the, the private sector can invest and, you know, it is sustainable. Mm -hmm. But we, we are talking about the financial environment, but I would say, Manuel, that the social and the legal environment... In relation, you, yeah. in, yeah. in relation to climate yeah. change. Be, because it's, you know, Africa, as you said, a lot of countries, I, I, I'm guessing the regulation, the public procurement procedures in Africa are completely different from each other. Are, are, the energy laws are, are different, are uh, aiming for this, this main uh, green transformation? <laughs> I will, uh, well, to if start you want to with, speak with numbers, be my guest. No, no, no. You're a lawyer, so not now. <laughs> <laughs> to 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 be quite frank, I am very familiar with Portuguese-speaking countries. I was in the past somewhat familiar with some of the French-speaking countries in West mm -hmm. Africa. I know nothing about the rest of those of them. Um, I would say that, as Anita put it very clearly in the beginning, Africa has risen. So. That old cliche about the legal environment or the, uh, the status of regulation and all that condescending views we tend to have about the legal environment, I don't think that at least talking about Portuguese speaking countries is not, is not there. The laws, are, the laws are modern, the laws are appropriate for what they want to do. Um, public procurement uh, laws exist and are fairly recent. Um, they have been pushed forward by the multilaterals by the likes of World Bank, of IFC, of the EIB, of uh, EBRD, clearly. Um, and that meant that not only, well, the, the, not only transparency was a main thing and access to market was a main thing in preparing pu pu public procurement laws, but some of the best practices uh, like the ability to replicate tender procedures, the um, Seeking uh, diversity and in inclusion in terms of in terms of, uh, of 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 awarding and governance of 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 awards, um, those things are those things have all, were already built in, generally speaking, into into public procurement laws. Um, what you still have, I'm I'm afraid I have to say that. As a challenge is uh, the minister uh, Vicente has just left, but is the perception of risk mm -hmm. and the perception of risk. Um, I think that in the legal industry, everybody knows that and in the financing industry, <laughs> we know that risk is a matter of perception because reality is always something, something else. But, uh, but the perception of risk is still there. The uh, uh, widespread use of direct awards instead of competition of competitive processes is still a problem. The use of local content rules is still a problem uh, be because they do not add to transparency at times, mm -hmm. and they have they create this suspicion about the way processes are, are, are done, and a certain perception. Um, this is a very um, well, uh, insulting thing to say, but a certain perception that there is not everywhere a very strong rule of law, which leads to very aggressive contracts in terms of stabilization and change of law clauses, which leads to a widespread use of uh, international arbitration rather than local courts. Those things are still there in spite of very modern, again, and very appropriate legislation to cover these issues. Mm -hmm. One thing you said, um, and again, this was a good example, uh, in relation to, to financing, we're talking about green transformation, green generation, green distribution, uh, uh, and clean energy, but climate action and climate adaptation is slightly different. It's, in, it's perceived everywhere, as a less business friendly mm -hmm. thing and where mm, you need more public money, you need more public incentives and again this, this, uh, this creation of the climate fund uh, in the agreement between Portugal and Cabo Verde is, uh, is, a, is a very good example of that. Mm -hmm. So there, there may be business elsewhere but in the specific in climate adaptation it may be more difficult. Yeah, I can imagine. Um, Ines, would you like to answer to some of uh, Manuel's... <laughs> I, 
Is that <laughs> I think I, no, I, um, not I, a real approach? I, I, I fully agree. And um, uh, just to pick a, also um, as, as part of the role of governments and multilaterals, not just by uh, de-risking, because it goes into your uh, point about risk perception for private investors, so we can provide guarantees, we can channel some of the more concessional financing. Another thing we can do as well, and, and picking up the point from the previous uh, speaker on just transition, so this is a very important point. Um, these, these transition, in the green transition, often uh, can have a social cost. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you know, you have people working on these power plants, uh, they need to be reskilled. Uh, it's a huge burden also for, for governments. And this is also, you know, where uh, multilaterals, uh, but also um, governments can, can help in reskilling the population and in, in making sure that the uh, transition and the green transition is not just about uh, the economic solutions for producing energy, but also, um, you know, addressing the challenges on the population uh, that are still dependent on fossil fuel uh, type of industries. Mm -hmm. Mia, um, I, I believe that uh, the risk perception is something that of obviously matters for, for your company and yourself, I would say, but I, I believe there's a, a lot of uh, other challenges to increase renewable energy and the access to affordable and sustainable energy, uh, as well as support market integration, sector reform. So. There's a, a biggest framework around this, this theme, right? Yes, I believe we could stay all morning here discussing yes, that. Yes, but we only have half an hour. So. Exactly, exactly. So I'll be touching some points that my colleagues have mentioned, but I would like to, as an investor in the, in the sector, I'd like to highlight three challenges that I, we believe mm -hmm. are essential to um, increase the penetration of renewables in the energy mix uh, across Africa. So, so first, we believe that um, African governments um, need to create the enabling environment for more private investments. And so to strengthen as well the institutions that are responsible for the management of the energy system. And uh, this was something that came across well uh, last month. I was in Nairobi, in Kenya at the African Energy Forum and where policymakers and energy um, experts stressed the need for political will uh, as well as supportive um, regulatory framework to enable a successful energy transition across uh, Africa. Mm -hmm. and as we're discussing risks, for us, regulatory risks are, uh, are a concern, especially in two areas, in terms of licensing and permitting and um, land acquisition, which uh, is something that can be critical uh, in some countries. But as well, how do we de-risk uh, investments in the renewable energy sector? And this goes to the, uh, the aspect of concessional finance. Mm -hmm. I believe that large quantities of concessional finance are, are essential uh, to uh, lower the, the risk of countries and projects, both country and project um, risks, to attract more investments. Because um, many of you may know that the cost uh, of, uh, of capital in Africa tends to be uh, two or three times higher than in advanced economies or in Europe. And this is a factor into equations. So uh, issues like uh, government guarantees, uh, favorable off-taker requirements are, are essential to ensure that projects in the end are bankable. And, uh, and third uh, area that we also see uh, of improvement uh, is the transmission sector, where we see there's a a lack of investment uh, in, the, in the sector, uh, which is key to make sure that supply meets demand. Mm -hmm. and this entails a major risk as well for, um, for investors because if we decide to, to generate, produce energy in a location, sometimes we're not sure that it can reach final, its final consumers and, and, and users, to say. And uh, what happens in this sector, in transmission sector, is that most of the investments have to be made by state-owned uh, enterprises, which many of which face severe financial strains. And the private sector participation uh, is very limited to laws, regulations, so it's a difficult sector to, um, to enter. And just to, to say that uh, early network uh, investment planning is key, is key in terms of transmission to make it uh, reliable and, and stable. And, um, and just to, to finalize, I'll say that uh, uh, ultimately the pathway 
for the energy sector transition in Africa will be dependent on the choices made by the, the local stakeholders. Mm -hmm. So mainly, Otavio, going back to your idea that we must ask Africa what Africa needs, not really taking this little luggage and put it there and use it because it's free and amazing. Those were called carpet baggers in the days yeah. of the Civil War. In the <laughs> Um, look, I, it's funny, you, you commented on my comment as being negative. I was maybe finding... I didn't say negative, I no, said not so not positive. positive. No, no, I, I, I actually <laughs> like that. I actually like that because I maybe was taking a page out of the book of negotiations with my Nigerian friends. Hit you as hard as you can and then if you're still standing, I'll talk to you after. She knows what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> the point is this, I'm actually very positive that we can solve this because there's a couple of things that have happened in the last year that are very indicative that we can get there. One of them is, it actually happened in Energy Asia in Kuala Lumpur a month ago, where all the countries from India all the way to well, actually Singapore and then Australia, basically said, stop talking about an energy transition. There will be many energy transitions, depending on geography, depending on resources, depending on economic availability. For us in the financing community to tell people what cake they can do and cannot do is what's caused the problem we have now today. They need, they need to know, whether it's in Africa or Asia, they know what they can do to lift people out of poverty and to reduce emissions. That's what energy transition is. It's energy additions with lower emissions overall. And if we support that and don't take our ideology of no, you can't touch that, no, you can't do this, we do end up with the result that we've had in the last five years. That's why I said in the last five years, we've made the problem worse. Mm -hmm. And that's what we need to change our narrative. We need to, st we can do it. If you ever follow Rob West in Thunderset Energy, he does amazing analysis. And one of the analysis he makes is that we can actually get to net zero at about $50 a ton of CO2 removed. If you take some of the tools out of the proverbial toolbox, it will cost you $400 a ton and no population is gonna support that. And so if we think we can solve the climate challenges, climate change challenges, without lifting people out of poverty, we will fail. Mm -hmm. Because they will not listen to us. They will do what it takes. That's why we're burning more coal. That's why we continue to burn wood. That's why we continue to burn animal excrement. Those to me should not take place. And I agree with what was said. I spent the 20, first 25 years of my 42 year career in energy. I started very young, by the way. <laughs> um, in the power sector, building solar, wind, nuclear, coal, oil, gas, you, you name it. So the limitations have to do with energy density. There are things in Africa we can do in rural areas we cannot do in Nairobi. There are areas where we need electrons and they can fix the problem. There are areas we need molecules or fuel. And there's processes, even in processing the materials we need for wind and solar, that you need high temperature components that only come from burning coal or burning oil. And that's the reality that unfortunately a lot of our government folks gave up on physics and chemistry and thermodynamics early in their high school career. So there's no space for a clever discussion with them because they don't understand it. They don't understand, which my friend here I'm sure will, well, what it's talking about VAR support and voltage support in grids in order to allow wind and solar to penetrate the grid near high population centers or capacity factors in the markets that don't exist today because what happens is what happens in California where I happen to live. We have the largest penetration of wind and solar, the highest electric rates at the consumer home. Mm -hmm. Why? Because of all the backup and all the systems that are needed to keep it 24 seven. I do not live by the solar or the wind factors. We turn the switch on, we expect to be there. We turn the gas, expect to be there. So unless we work together on making resilience and affordability and low intermittency, and we can do it. We just have to give up our bias, blame everybody for their self-interest, and just come to the table willing to change your mind. I'm an engineer by training, so I like to solve problems. My wife doesn't like it because I always come up with a solution as opposed to listen. Normally but not. A, uh, usually normal. doesn't work. Yeah. So I'm doing my best to change that. Uh, but it's, that is the attitude we need to have. Mm -hmm all of us in the sector to solve the problem. And it can be solved. Mm -hmm. I, I, I'm guessing that Mr. Hastin Shikoku is quite agreeing, yes, with you. So... I'd like to... Yeah, to, thank you, thank you. I'd like to say something here. 
Thank you. I agree with the point that we need, we shouldn't really be telling Africa what they need to do. That's very important. But I would like to challenge my African colleagues that are in the room to say, let's take this uh, opportunity that we have been given the chance to tell the world what we want to do, not what they want to do in Africa, but what we want to be done in Africa, and be able to present that message clearly in a manner that attracts investment. Because one of the challenges we have is that sometimes money is there, but the people that have money are not receiving a proposition, business propositions that make sense, that are bankable, that they can, they, can, uh, they can invest in. It is the responsibility of African uh, colleagues in the room to really fully understand that money does not just come. It is, it is, it is attracted by sound strategies, sound policies, and sound business propositions. And we should be able to package this and really tell the world clearly what is it that we want to, to, to be done in, in Africa. Let's depart from a humanitarian approach mm -hmm. where we look for money based on um, the tragedies and challenges that we are facing. Um, so we go and really uh, um, uh, 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 call for support uh, uh, based on the sympathy that we have. In this particular sector, in this particular green sector, investment will not be based on emotions. Mm -hmm. Investment will not be based on sympathy and tears. In investment will be based on bankable propositions, will be based on a, a, a conducive uh, investment environment or a conducive policy regulate, regulatory and, uh, and make an yes. investor confident that I can do something there. So that's a challenge for Africa. That's a challenge for us to tell the story. If we don't do that, then we create a vacuum for actually people to tell us what we should do instead. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I, I would say, uh, Mr. Hastings, uh, that, that the investments in key areas like clean energy uh, uh, would have this kind of transformation, so social transformation, economic transformation, health, benefits for everybody, not only in Africa, right? Uh, 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 can you walk us through these main benefits? Because we, are only, um, we only have more 15 minutes. So like a takeaway message for all of us here? All right, so um, to me, of course, we have 15 minutes, so I'll try to be brief. Yes, so sorry, I have to go to Cap Verde. Investments in this sector really should uh, should emphasize core benefits for them to also be appealing to, to the vast uh, uh, majority of Africans. And uh, from our cities, there are some of the core benefits that we have actually, um, actually uh, realized from just investing in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the green sector. The first actually is, um, is basically just the, the health benefits. We are transitioning from emissions. We are improving air quality. And this has resulted in, uh, in uh, longer and healthier lives. C40 has, has statistics. And if you would like to, access, to have access to them, we can actually share that. We have uh, statistics that uh, uh, when you invest, you transition from coal-fired energy to actually renewables. The, um, the number of uh, uh, premature deaths, uh, hospital admissions, actually um, it does, does decrease. Um, some of our studies in all the C40 cities have shown that co-generated electricity under a current co-plan scenario that we have in all C40 cities globally could lead to 264,000 premature deaths. Mm -hmm. in the, in, this is just in C40 cities, and we're talking about, about 90 mega cities. 264,000 premature deaths per year between now and 2030. This 260,000 per year, and do, do the maths. Mm -hmm. There will be like 121,000 um, preterm births just because of, um, of uh, impacts of uh, emissions. 93,000, 93,600, 93, new asthma cases amongst children. 
and 247,000 asthma emergency visits. So when we get, we do the right things, we actually are uh, addressing this problem. Let's talk about the other benefit will be economic. And um, I, can't, I can't talk about economic benefits without starting from job creation. Both COVID-19, the economic crisis, mm -hmm. have actually put lots of people in Africa out of employment. And this is a, a, a continent that already had unemployment rates that are so high. And it was basically just increasing the, the existing problem. But not, not, not to mention that Africa is a youthful continent. So there are also all these young people that are, that are getting out of universities that want jobs. So we need to actually use this opportunity of addressing climate change or transitioning to green to also create good green jobs. At the C40 Mayor Summit uh, in Buenos Aires, where the uh, mayors met globally, they made a commitment that between now and 2030, they will create um, 50 million good green jobs, and they are actually delivering on that. If I may just uh, take one study from South Africa, uh, South African five uh, metro, metro, metro areas that C40 did, we actually found that um, just urban climate actions could create over 1.8 million jobs in South Africa by 2030, and over 1.1 million jobs can be created from the urban climate actions that are focusing on emission reduction. These are buildings, transportation, and the energy sectors. And uh, about 700 jobs can be created from the adaptation side of things, or, uh, actions that are building on resilience. So this is, also, this is an opportunity, ladies and gentlemen, to address the unemployment crisis that mm -hmm. we have. And we should make sure that as we talk about just transition, this is key to, 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 to what we do. Mm -hmm. Let me stop there for now since you only have 15 minutes, but uh, I can expound later if, if we have time. I don't think we'll be having any more time. So sorry, because I, I would keep going on with a lot of questions regarding this theme. But uh, I, I could say, I could say, Ines, that uh, there's this additional impact that your involvement brings. When I say your, of course, your bank involvement brings that goes well beyond financing. And so I think this could be the, the takeaway message to uh, to your final um, uh, remark here in our panel. Thank you. Um, yes, indeed. I think, you know, we've concluded uh, the ad addressing climate change and restoring uh, nature is really a defining uh, challenge of, of our times. And it's our responsibility, not just as, as governments, multilaterals, uh, businesses, uh, to make the right, the right choices. Um, there are a number of things as a multilateral that we, we can do, and a policy dialogue is one of them in terms of changing the regulatory environment and, and, and framework to enable investments, because I mm -hmm. think it is true that we're still lacking uh, bankable projects so from a pure commercial perspective, and we talked about also some of the legal aspects related to that. So I think you know, multilaterals, through policy dialogues, through working with the government, do have a responsibility um, in, in terms of working on amending the laws. We do a lot on, on renewable auctions, for example, and you know, on, on the side of procurement as well, um, to enable then you know, and attract private sector to minimize the risk. So definitely, I think you know, uh, policy dialogue, dialogue is a big component. We talked uh, quite a bit about concessional finance, and I think that is still going to be key. Uh, we work a lot with a number of, of, of climate funds, the, the Green Climate Fund. We actually now will have a Puchkis at the elm of the, of the fund, but also the uh, Climate Investment Fund. So these are really important tools, and I'm very uh, glad to hear about the Cape Verde um, also initiative. Um, so that, I think, will still be, uh, you know, a, a really important uh, component. But uh, ultimately, it will be about our choices, about where we decide, you know, to make the investments, to push for changes on, on, on the regulatory side and, and the legal side. And that's, that's really up to us. Mm -hmm. Speaking about investments, Miguel, your conclusion, if you please. Thank you. Thank you. Um, concluding remarks from my, um, from my side. Just to, to, to highlight what I believe was a, uh, a very good partnership announced uh, last month between Senegal and the EU, the mm -hmm, Just Energy mm -hmm. Transition Partnership. 
which I would like to finish, given the, um, the context of this, uh, this forum, bringing yes. Europe and, and Africa closer. So I do believe 40 percent, right? Of yes. Senegal's, yeah. So it's a, there's a goal of increasing the, renew, the mix of renewables in the, the matrix from 30 percent to 40 percent. And this is quite remarkable uh, because Senegal is a country that is starting to explore its grass reserves, rightly so, to ensure energy access to the whole population but not reducing on its commitment to, um, to renewable energy. And, uh, and this is going to create a lot of opportunities for private investors, We're talking about what was announced, 2.5 billion um, euros in terms of new and additional financing, which is great. And uh, it goes very much uh, in line with, uh, with the words of President Macky Sall saying that uh, Africa no longer needs aid, but instead positive partnerships. And I do believe that this is... a an example of a positive uh, partnership and uh, as as well uh, an African proverb says that if you want to go fast you go alone, mm -hmm. if you want to go far you go together and I believe that uh, Europe and, uh, and Africa can go very far by working together in a just energy partnership. I'm sure, I'm sure it will. And uh, Monel, please. <laughs> well I have the benefit of having listened to my <laughs> my colleagues before. Just transition. As early as, uh, well, as recently as last month, if not already in July, the Minister of Natural Resources and, I can't remember the name, and oil and gas for Angola, was saying that uh, do not impose transition on all of us in the same manner, at the same pace, take into account the actual situation of each country. In the same interview, and I'm very sorry, I can't remember the numbers, uh, I focus on some of them, but then I forget the others. Um, you were saying that notwithstanding that Angola is an oil generation, an oil production country, where oil is the cornerstone of their economy, or oil and gas, they have the major part of their energy generation comes from water, so comes from hydro plants. I can't remember the, name, the number again. So, two things. Uh, one, let's let's there is a huge opportunity for re renewable energy in Africa, and Miguel has just said that, uh, huge. Uh, but we need to tackle or we need to help those countries, not fund them for uh, the renewable energy projects. They have to be business-like and they have to be bankable, but we need to help them um, support those projects and support that transition through their traditional means of living like natural resources in general, like the critical raw materials we won't get rid of, like the oil and gas we tend to, well, <laughs> to increase imports into Europe and, all, and elsewhere, although we don't want to talk about it. And um, so clearly we need to do some reverse engineering or some financial engineering in relation to that, maybe take advantage of their lower emissions and have some sort of carbon market, carbon trade and trading market with them, which might be helpful. Um, and then on a very personal view, um, we have said a number of things about funding, about permitting, about regulatory risks and risks in general, but um, projects to happen. And there's a lot of work being done and, uh, and very gratifying work being done in, in most African countries I'm aware of. Okay, thank you so much, Otavio. I'd like to say that we should keep in mind the 80% of people that only use 40% of the world's energy, and that's a fact. So when we look at it, we should invest every penny we have in wind and solar, um, because the lower carbon, the nature of it, and for some areas, it's exactly what you need. But you, beyond the electrons, you need a fuel, because if you don't change the fuel mix, I'll give you a statistic that's very impressive. So from 2005 to today, the United States has reduced the emissions of about a billion tons of CO2 every year on an analyzed basis. Why? It wasn't government driven, it was market driven because price of natural gas was so low that 61% uh, of that came from natural gas by eliminating coal and the other 39% came from penetration of wind and solar. There's a recipe right there for doing it. And like Ines said, some technologies have lower capital in have a higher capital cost, but a lower uh, 
time recovery of that capital. Natural gas happens to be one of them, compared to coal. You build a coal plant, it's 30 to 40 years to recover the capital. You build a gas plant in 12 years, by 2037, 28, you can shut them down and everybody's happy. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you need that fuel that's got low, no particulates to deal with the asthma issues that our previous speaker said, to deal with the particulates or indoor cooking. You need a fuel that is critical for fertilizers. Let's not forget that. We need a fuel that uh, to extract hydrogen takes seven times less energy than extracting it from water. So those are the things that we need to talk about and do it. And Europe needs to actually assess something very important in dealing with all this. It continues to take the resources of natural gas from Egypt, Algeria, Nigeria, Equatorial Guinea, Angola, Mozambique, and it's praying for a warm winter to solve the Russian problem. Praying for a warm winter is not energy policy. Let me just make that very, very clear. We cannot use climate change to solve our economic problems for the next four years. There's no new supply significant until 2027. And so 500 billion in subsidies 500 billion euros in subsidies last winter, that's more than half the total tax revenue of Europe, is not sustainable. Hmm. You could have taken 50 billion of that and created all the supply you need to replace the 160 BCM of gas from Russia. And we didn't. And next year is gonna be the same problem. So everybody continues to pray for a warm winter as part of the energy policy, kind of unacceptable. If the 38 OCDE countries reach net zero by 2050, and the rest of the world stays on the same energy profile, we'll reduce 10.5% of CO2 emissions. That's a fact. Yeah. I can change Asia from coal to gas, and I reduce emissions by 15%. So let's work together on natural gas, wind, solar, to really make a difference and not deal with the results we've actually seen in the last five years. Mm -hmm. Mr. Hessings, after all, I have two minutes for you, <laughs> if you please. Uh, two minutes. Yes. You know, maybe what I can just say as putting, as putting short and uh, really echoing what uh, the mayors, the C40 mayors, especially Mayor Sadiq Khan says is when it comes to climate change, the consequences of inaction are too grave to ignore. Uh, we cannot afford to delay or hesitate any longer. I think time for action is now. And let's take advantage of this partnership between Europe and Africa to find those high impact actions in the energy sector that can shift the needle, that can re help us reduce the emissions, that can uh, uh, but help us also address poverty issues and, in uh, and inclusivity. We need to unlock the needed financing, the needed technology, the skills uh, to actually accelerate that. Um, for me, uh, I, I work with mayors. I think there is also need to facilitate uh, collaboration between spheres of government uh, to ensure that uh, what cities do does also contribute to the nationally determined contributions. They, we, as we can't be divided by governance systems when we are serving the same people. So a clear message there for collaborative or coordinated governance in addressing climate change. I'll end there. Mm -hmm. I, I would say, I would still, uh, just to, to finish, Ms. Essing, is the Mayor of London still the C40 chair? Mr. Yes, he is. He can, yeah, because I, I, I will use a phrase that uh, to, to, to close our panel that he used in a keynote speak, uh, speech, sorry, given in 2021, I, I suppose, it, at COP26 in Glasgow. He said that together we can and we must use the power of cities across the globe and continue to lead the change when it comes to tackling the climate crisis, tackling the necessary, taking the necessary action right now. Not in 10, 20 or 30 years time, but right now. I would adapt this sentence that said, we must use the power of cities, countries, continents, but mainly the power of people, the power of humans, the power Absolutely. of each one of us here in this room and to all of those who are watching, to uh, act, not in 10, 20, or 30 years time, but right now. So right on time, we finish our panel. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you to our panel. Muito obrigada, bom dia.